can catch up as they, as they join as we have a lot on the agenda for today. So first of all, thank you so much everybody for participating to uh, the second of the action workshops that come after the first ever 24-1 community conference. We developed four action workshops that are based on some of the community priorities that residents uh, from the 24-1 community have expressed, one of which was housing, um, and spe specifically how to have stable housing in 24-1 community. And so as part of this, especially given the eviction moratorium, a lot of uh, financial instability, we just wanted to make sure to provide an updated workshop for residents and specifically renters um, to make sure that they know what their rights are in general, but also given the uh, current eviction moratorium that's going on. So today we will be hearing from Marissa Cohen from EHOC. Thank you for joining us. We'll also be hearing from Eli Gross. And then we'll also be hearing about some additional resources, both through Beyond Housing, um, through our rental housing program, as well as through a new rental assistance program we have to hopefully prevent future evictions, because even though we have an eviction moratorium right now, we do want to make sure that people are getting current on their rents so that when that moratorium is lifted, that they aren't in trouble at that point. Um, I believe most of you have received an agenda by now, but we'll be hearing from Marissa first. Um, then we'll, uh, we'll be hearing from Elad later on. And we'll also throughout have a couple of trivia points, door prizes, as if we were in person, where you'll get a chance to uh, win a prize if you get some election trivia correct. Am I missing anything else, um, Raina or Rachel, who I believe are also on the organizing team? So the only thing I would say is make sure that you use the chat function or raise your hand and we will, we are, it's a lot of us behind the scenes that are working to manage this meeting and make sure everybody gets their question answered. So we appreciate your patience. Thank you for your time and please try to get as much information out of this as you can. Thank you. And finally, a big thank you to everybody in the organizing team. I see Charlene on here. And then, of course, Dwayne and uh, Claire from MU Extension for all of your work on this um, and Amy as well and anybody else I've missed. So we will go ahead and get started uh, with Marissa. And uh, all of you should uh, just so that we can share it with those after the session as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for the introduction. And thank you all so much for inviting EHOC to be a part of this conversation about a part of you all's conference. Um, I am going to share my screen, but I'd like to utilize the chat function a little bit um, since we are, you know, not too large of a group, this may be uh, beneficial. I'd love to know um, on a scale of one to five, what's your level of understanding of fair housing and landlord tenant rights in, in Missouri? If you can put that in the chat, one being very little knowledge, five being pretty much mastery. Awesome. All right, well, this is great. Everyone's putting those numbers in. Thank you. Okay, so we're, we're starting around the same place here. So I am going to um, give you all an overview of the fair housing laws overall, and then also touch on landlord tenant laws. I do know that um, I believe that Elad is also going to be speaking a little bit further about um, eviction resources and that sort of thing. So I will touch on the CDC moratorium um, and some of those requirements, and also share some links with you all about um, the CDC moratorium and the declaration form that's available for the community. So at this time, I will go ahead and share my screen. Um, yeah. All righty. So um, as Stephanie said, my name is Marissa Cohen and I'm the education coordinator at the Equal Housing and Opportunity Council. Uh, um, in Metropolitan St. Louis, and this is a Know Your Rights Landlord Tenant and Fair Housing Training Workshop. 
Um, so EHOC is a nonprofit fair housing organization that assists people who feel that they have been victims of housing discrimination. Our mission is to work to ensure equal access to housing for all people through education, counseling, investigation, and enforcement. And these are our main um, departments in our organization. And so our education department, we go out and we do these um, trainings where we talk about, you know, fair housing and landlord tenant rights to a number of different people from grassroots or organizing groups. Uh, to landlords even, you know, making sure that everyone is aware of this information. Our counseling um, is through our landlord tenant hotline and our discrimination hotline. And that is um, basically when people feel that they are being discriminated against, they're giving us a call. Um, and I had my number at the beginning, but that number is 314-534-5800. Sometimes it's really hard to tell, you know, when you are in a situation of housing discrimination, sometimes it can seem that it's actually a landlord tenant issue. And so we also have our landlord tenant hotline um, where people can call and get information about maybe how to maneuver through some of the challenges that they may be having with their landlords. And then also our investigation team. So our investigation goes out and tests claims of discrimination. And this is really unique to um, fair housing organizations because that is really at the crux of, of who we are as an organization. We are able to prove um, with, with data that housing discrimination is happening. And when we get those calls of suspi you know, suspicion of housing discrimination, that helps us um, fuel those investigations and make sure we're finding the players that are in the housing community that are practicing illegal housing um, discrimination. And then lastly, of course, we have our enforcement arm, and that is our staff attorneys. Um, now we've beefed up that arm pretty strongly during this time, as you all know, facing a lot of challenges with evictions as a result of COVID-19. So um, we also have our eviction defense team, our eviction defense program, and that can be reached through the same phone number. You just select which option applies to you. Um, and essentially, they are able to assist people who are getting evicted as a result of COVID, um, as long as you meet the screening criteria. In general, overall, our services are free of charge. Um, there are no income limits or, or income restrictions for our fair housing and our landlord tenant counseling overall. So a little bit about the Fair Housing Act. So the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968. And essentially, a very broad definition of this is that it prohibits discrimination against protected classes during housing related activities. And this we will break down because yes, who are these protected classes? What are these housing related activities that it's referring to? We're gonna talk about that a little bit more, um, but I do wanna mention that this is considered to be the last legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. And that is because this leg legislation sat in Congress for two years before it was passed. And it was only passed seven days after the assassination of Martin Luther King, during the time of civil unrest, during the time of, um, obviously they had already passed the Voting Rights Act, they had segregated schools and this was sort of that last push for um, equality as it relates to civil rights the civil rights movement and um, they passed this seven days after his death so it's considered to be the last legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. Our organization wouldn't exist had it not been for the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. So like I said I am going to break those down so the protected classes include race color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, and familial status. Um, the housing related protections include renting, um, buying or selling a home, obtaining or refinancing a mortgage, obtaining homeowners insurance, um, viewing real estate advertisements, and even zoning laws and occupancy permits. So fair housing is not limited to renters. It is also for people who are purchasing homes and even during their home stay, so maybe they are having challenges um, with some discriminatory policies and say, for instance, homeowners associations or, or condo associations, those sort of things, um, th that would also fall under the fair housing laws. Um, also wanna mention the real estate advertisements it is not limited to what is published in, say for instance, a newspaper. It really relates to all type of publication, whether that is spoken, whether that's a written piece of paper and posted on a door, all of that would count um, under that real estate advertisement. So some of the housing services protections, this includes, um, basically it extends beyond, like I said, it's not just for renters, but it also extends to temporary or long-term shelters 
organizations that are offering rental assistance like vouchers or subsidies, um, agencies that are operating housing counseling and placement programs, clean and sober housing, transitional housing, and even motels that function as primary housing rather than vacation lodging. So these, these fair housing protections also apply to people in these particular um, organizations and scenarios. Um, so I have a question for the audience and I hope you didn't get a peek, but there are additional protected classes at local level, right? And this helps to extend or strengthen some of the protections that are provided at a federal level. So we already went through the seven protected classes at a federal level. That includes race, color, national origin, religion, sex, disability, and familial status. I have a question for you all. Considering some of you all had a moderate knowledge of it, um, what would you say, what do you think is one additional protected class that we have at a local level? And you can put your answer in the chat box. Shayla, sexual orientation. Huh, Shayla, I wonder how did you know that? Okay, all right, thank you. Source of income protection, awesome. That's right, that's right. I wonder, how huh, are we gonna get all of them? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Alrighty, so yes, you all are correct. Thank you for participating in that. Um, and St. Louis City, additional protected classes include gender identity expression, sexual orientation, and source of income protection. Um, and basically what that is saying is that you can't be denied housing or treated differently, or ha given different terms or conditions because of that gender identity or expression or your sexual orientation. Um, and then also for source of income, uh, a housing provider must count all lawful sources of income, right? All lawful sources of income. And this also includes Section 8 vouchers. So in St. Louis City, it is illegal to say, for instance, if a person is inquiring about the availability of housing, and they're being asked if they have a Section 8 voucher, and they say, well, we don't accept Section 8 vouchers. That would be considered illegal in St. Louis City. And the Civil Rights Enforcement Agency is the entity that is enforcing that um, source of income protection in St. Louis City. Again, it is for only St. Louis City, but that goes to show us in St. Louis County that there are more pushes, advocacy, policy things that we can uh, push for from our local governments as well. So in St. Louis County, the only additional protected class is sexual orientation gen and gender identity. And that applies to the following municipalities that I have listed here. Um, University City, Olivet, Clayton, Richmond Heights, Kirkwood, Ferguson, Creevecore, Maplewood, and unincorporated St. Louis County. So at a state level, our only additional protected class is ancestry. And this is basically speaking to, um, for instance, say you have a, a person who was born of two immigrant parents, but they are being denied housing or they're being treated differently in their housing um, because of their ancestry of, say, for instance, their parents, although they may have been born here or whatever the case may be, they're being denied housing or treated differently because of that ancestry. Um, this can also be applied to things such as last names. If a last name has a history of feuding with another particular last name and they're saying, oh no, well, we won't you know, provide housing. We won't, we, we won't really do business with this particular family because we don't have a good history. That could be another claim of ancestry. I will say it is the least common. Um, however, in the state of Illinois, there are a number of additional protections such as ancestry, age 40 plus, um, domestic violence status is even a protected class, military status, military status, unfavorable discharge from the military, sexual orientation, et cetera. The list goes on, right? And so at a local level, there's more advocacy, more things that we can do uh, around additional protected classes to make sure that we are really enforcing and protected by the fair housing laws. So kind of like I mentioned before, um, some of these prohibited acts, what are they? It's blanket denial of availability of housing, um, difference in terms and conditions. This is oftentimes seen with familial status, for instance. So familial status um, protected class is speaking to any household with children the ages 18 years and under. And so this can also apply to a person who is pregnant, um, a pregnant mom, or even a person that is attempting to gain custody of a child. So 
a difference in terms and conditions could look like an increased security deposit amount, right? Um, because you have children and they're saying, well, you're probably going to mess up, you know, things like that. That that would be a, a prohibited act because that could be discriminatory to fam families with children. Also restricting choice, discriminatory advertisement, whether that's blatant discriminatory advertisement or a, um, a subtle Right, so blatant, blatant statements like no men allowed would be discriminatory, um, but then also sometimes it's more subtle when we're speaking to um, people with disabilities by saying things like must be able to care for oneself or able bodies, that would be discriminatory, right? Blockbusting, um, providing false information, just blanket false information, maybe to make it less favorable. And then also refusal to make reasonable accommodations or modifications. And this is spe specifically speaking to people with disabilities. You have the right to request a reasonable accommodation or a modification. And that housing provider has to work with a reasonable accommodation if the request initially is not reasonable, which we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few. So, um, like I said, we do look at discrimination, discriminatory treatment. So sometimes this is overt, very obvious in your face, and sometimes it's more subtle, right? Um, more subtle ways that we see discrimination happening is, is through steering, screening, voice profiling, and even redlining, right? So redlining was banned in 1968. However, the impact of it is still felt today. Um, redlining was when basically, uh, lenders or, or, or um, financial providers or housing or organizations would draw red lines around communities and would not invest in those communities or would not allow certain people to move in those communities, particularly black people, right? In St. Louis, we still see the impacts of it as a lot of those communities that barred black people from moving in and owning homes, they are still predominantly um, uh, white. So steering would be, for instance, um, say for instance you are looking at to you know move into a new home or you're even looking to rent and they're telling you that because you have children you have to live on the first floor for instance in a rental case or you're steering they're steering you away from a community that you were initially interested in and towards a community that they say you may feel more comfortable in or things of that nature but it's not really where you would like to go and one thing to keep in mind is you're, you have the choice to live where you would like to live, right? As long as you qualify and all of those things, you have that choice. It's not up to the, 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 the realtor or, you know, a housing provider to say, oh, no, you probably want to live over here instead. Um, an instance where this has happened with our executive director, who is a black male, he lived in an apartment community. And when he filled out the application, he noticed that they were completing his application in red ink. Well, come to find out later on after some further investigation, um, they were putting all of the people, the black people, they were filling out their applications with red ink and then putting them in this one particular area in the back of the housing community and filling out white applicants with black ink and then putting them in the front of that housing community. And so that's a prime example of steering, but you wouldn't know that is happening until you look around and you say, hey, why are all the families with children right here? Or hey, why are all you know the black people live in the same area or the Hispanic people or you know whatever the case may be? And that's what we are working against, right? And that's why we need to know when this stuff is happening. So another example of a more subtle way of discrimination is screening. So when calling about, you know, the availability of housing and you're being asked, well, do you have children? Well, how many children do you have? Huh, how old are they? You know, before telling whether or not a two bedroom unit is available, for instance, you know, that does not determine whether or not the unit is available, all of those preliminary questions. They're just simply screening out less favorable applicants. Sometimes this happens when um, someone is voice profiling, say for instance, they can hear an accent over the phone and they can tell that maybe they, you know, are from, a, they are a different ethnicity and they're asking, well, do you have a citizen, proof of citizenship? Do you have, you know, a social security card and these other things? That is creating an undue burden, right? Or a, an additional barrier to that person's access to housing. And it's not something that's being applied across the board. Right. If it is something that's been applied across the board and it's in their policies, then that is another story. Um, but that's just an example of what screening would be. 
Alrighty. And so in terms of enforcement, EHOC typically files complaints with HUD or the Missouri Commission for Human Rights um, or any other local or state agency. Like I mentioned, the Civil Rights um, Enforcement Agency would be an example. Um, in order to file a complaint, it has to be within one year of that discrimination, for instance, um, when we file those complaints with HUD. Our conciliations, I mean, our enforcement also take the place, take the form of conciliations or settlements where we um, come to terms with that housing provider, say for instance, they pay a number of, you know, they pay a number of damages, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there are, are other rip repercussions to that. Um, and then also private lawsuits. So this can be filed within two years. And then lastly, it's important to know that when filing a fair housing complaint, retaliation is protected. And so it's actually tracks even, and it's able to add to whatever that initial complaint was when they, they engage in retaliation as a result of a fair housing complaint being filed. So um, I'm just gonna touch on this briefly because I've already mentioned it, familial status discrimination. This is who it applies to. It's oftentimes seen as it relates to terms and conditions, discriminatory terms and conditions. Um, and then also relationship to occupancy limits. And so the standard is two per two, two heartbeats per room, right? Um, there are some exceptions to this depending on the actual size of the unit or the room or the apartment. Um, but typically the relationship occupancy limit is standard for two people per room, regardless of that relationship. It could be a mother and a child. It could be, you know, um, whatever the relationship is between the two people. It could also be a married couple, right? And then affirmative marketing is allowed for a familial status protected class. So that's to say that housing providers can say things such as, we welcome families with children. This is a great place to raise your family. That, that is allowed for familial status and for discrimination. I'm sorry, for disability. So right now, um, during this pandemic, we have seen a number of fair housing challenges arise, right? Because right now there are a lot of people who may be more vulnerable. Maybe they have job loss. Maybe they have, you know, a different financial situation that's causing for uh, uh, instability in their housing. So these are the top concerns that we have been seeing right now as a result of the pandemic. Um, an increase in sexual harassment, domestic violence, um, also national origin discrimination, um, and then pe for people with disabilities, um, discrimination for people with disabilities. So with, when we talk about gender discrimination, this includes sexual harassment, domestic violence, and sexual orientation and gender identity. For sexual harassment, um, the housing provider is liable for any actions of their employees or their agents. And so this includes the leasing office, this includes the leasing agent, the maintenance worker, all of that, um, what the housing provider would be liable for those actions. And this is oftentimes in forms of um, requesting sexual favors in exchange for rent or services, right? And it's important to know that even if at one point that person consented, but no longer feels comfortable with that arrangement, they have the right to stand up and still file a claim for a fair housing, uh, of sexual harassment under fair housing. So whether that's just comments on that person's looks or their body, threatening to evict someone that won't engage in these sexual acts or even touching someone without consent. Um, in 2018, we, EHOC, won a case of sexual harassment where one person stood up and said that they were being sexually harassed. As a result of that one person standing up, 14 other women were also standing up and saying that they were being sexually harassed by this same landlord in St. Louis City, right? It always takes that one person to really stand up and say something because that helps our investigations to find those other 14 um, individuals who also experienced the same treatment. Well, as a result of this case, those women were um, given 1600, I'm sorry, $625,000 in damages, as well as that landlord was no longer able to manage properties, no longer able to um, own properties to basically continue the sexual harassment to other victims. And so it's important that although it's a long-term process, it is something that is impactful and very helpful um, when you say something about illegal housing practices. Um, with domestic violence, this um, also speaks to nuisance ordinances because oftentimes survivors of domestic violence have to choose between 
calling the police or facing their abuser, right? Um, because of nuisance ordinances, it puts them in this un this 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 horrible predicament where they're choosing, you know, not to call the police simply because they don't want their property to be deemed as a nuisance, or their landlord may evict them as a result. And so to protect against that for people who live in subsidized housing or who may have a housing choice voucher uh, or a Section 8 voucher or public housing or even um, low income housing, um, there's the Vi Violence Against Women Act. And this basically prevents evictions directly related to domestic violence. And um, they would just file one of these forms, a self-certification form, a HUD form um, 5382 with their housing provider and let them know about the domestic violence situation that they are facing. And that would protect them against getting evicted as a result of calling the police too many times, right? Um, in Missouri, there is a similar protection. Um, as of 2019, there's the Missouri VAWA which prevents evictions as a result um, directly related to domestic violence. But what this allows for, it's a little bit different. Um, there isn't a form associated with it. However, it allows for an early termination in the lease for that individual. However, the landlord can charge a reasonable termination fee to the victim. And that reasonable fee is determined by the landlord. So it's some protections, but obviously there's a little bit more ways to go because the federal VAWA also allows for emergency transfers and that sort of thing. And that's not something that the state VAWA um, allows. So I'm running a little low on time. So I'm gonna talk through this a little bit more um, with disability discrimination. It is also affirmative marketing allowed. So like I said, saying things such as, um, we have accessible units, you know, it's wheelchair accessible. Um, we have universally designed units, those sort of things would speak to a person with disabilities and let them know that they would have a comfortable living situation um, with that particular housing provider. And so as far as the COVID-19 pandemic, right now, um, nationally, we are researching, you know, the impact, the long-term impact of COVID-19. And it is likely that having, you know, contracted the virus and having long-term effects of, of your everyday life activities can actually constitute um, as a disability under the Fair Housing Act. And so the definition of that is any mental or physical impairment, uh -oh, any mental or physical impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. But this does not mean that the housing provider can at, ask about the details of the disability or can you face discrimination based on being regarded as having an impairment? So just because they can see that you may have an impairment. However, reasonable accommodations are allowed. And so, like I mentioned, that is the definition of disability discrimination. Um, it is not a requirement to receive disability income in order to um, qualify under the Fair Housing Act for a disability. And then I will say, um, so people who are protected are people who have a record of an impairment or regarded as having such. And so this is just an example of some of the disabilities that will qualify. And when we say not protected, this is simply speaking to um, on a standalone basis. So for instance, a person who is recovering from alcohol or drug addiction can say that they have a disability. However, a person who is actively using cannot say that because they are actively using, that is their disability. And that's basically what we're saying. That's not to say that they cannot have another disability that would qualify them under the Fair Housing Act. Um, so what are reasonable accommodations? I've mentioned this a few times. They are basic changes in terms and conditions of the lease. So this includes handicap parking, lease reading accommodations, et cetera. Those are just some examples, but it's in order to be granted, it must first be necessary and reasonable meaning that it cannot create an undue financial or an administrative burden on the housing provider. And if it does, then it should be a conversation. It should be a, a back and forth sort of process between the housing provider and that individual with a disability to talk about ways that the request can be more um, uh, reasonable and, and less financially burdensome or administratively burdensome. 
with reasonable modifications, these are different because um, they are changes in the physical construction of the property. So this is at the tenant's expense and the landlord must allow this um, as long as it is completed in a workmanlike fashion, although the landlord may require a set aside for the return to the original condition. So this includes installing ramps, grab bars, remodeling the kitchen um, to make it accessible, et cetera. Those are just some examples. It's the tenant's responsibility with a, a disability to show that they have a disability and that that request is related to the disability. The landlord is not allowed to require an independent medical examination. And also the landlord may deny the request if it creates an unreasonable, like I mentioned, financial or administrative burden, or if it endangers the safety of the building or other tenant. And that has to be decided um, objectively. When making the request, it can be oral, it can be at any point, it does not have to be within a particular form, um, but the reasonable accommodation process begins at the time of telling a housing prov provider that they are disabled and need something changed in order to accommodate that disability. All right, any questions so far? I know I have just a little bit of time left. So we're gonna talk about some landlord tenant rights overall. Let me check to see if we have any questions. Nope, okay. Alrighty, so we're gonna talk about some landlord tenant rights overall in the state of Missouri. So as we know, it's the tenant's responsibility to pay rent on time, not to damage the property, um, not up to allow others to move in without permission, and not to uh, rent the apartment to someone else or sublease the apartment. It's the landlord's responsibility to provide habitable property, meaning basic um, amenities, the roof is working, plumbing is working, very basic um, habitability standards in the state of Missouri, um, but then also to make reasonable repairs, to give proper notices for rent increases, and that will, deter that will be determined by the type of lease that they have or what is written in their lease. So if it's a month-to-month -month lease or an oral lease, it will be 30 days. That's the proper notice time frame. It's 30 days standard. However, if they have a written lease and it's noted in their lease that maybe um, a rent increase comes at the renewal of a new lease. So for instance, when they are being informed about time to sign their new lease, then they will also be being informed about um, any rent increases or changes to that contract or agreement. And then also, um, it is the landlord's responsibility to take proper steps to evict for non-payment of rent, which we'll talk about what those are. Uh -oh. So in terms of the CDC moratorium, um, what kind of housing falls in? So these are, this is a list of the qualifications in order to apply the CDC moratorium to your particular housing. It is for renters specifically, um, and I am actually going to share the link with you all that has this information because I know it's a lot of text and <laughs> you'll just get lost in all of it. Um, but the link that I'm gonna share also includes a declaration form. And on that form, that is actually what you submit to your landlord at the time of um, when you are maybe falling behind, for instance, on your rent as a result of the, the um, pandemic. So I am going to... Um, Go right past this and I will share that information with you all. Uh oh, alrighty. So, in terms of repairs, when you are facing challenges with your landlord, it is important to keep a written record of your contact with them, right? Keep evidence of the condition of the apartment, take pictures, keep a record of the important um, dates. And in some cases, even calling an inspector is helpful. It helps to determine the necessity of that repair, as well as um, maybe even the responsibility of that repair, right? So it, upon moving in, it's important to take these pictures. When you're asking for um, repairs, it's important to take those pictures and keep those pictures on a drive. Um, something maybe outside of your phone, maybe even a thumb drive or a cloud or something of that sort, because we lose our phones all the time, right? And you all received the complete um, landlord tenant rights packet that we created. And within that packet, there is a form that can help you track, you know, your communication with the landlord about specific repairs. It's called the repair fact sheet. Let me see. Perfect. Perfect. 
Thank you. Um, and then also calling that inspector will help you to determine, like I said, the necessity of the repair. So in the case that your landlord is not repairing, you have the right under the Missouri landlord tenant law to repair and deduct up to $300 or half of the rent, whichever amount is greater. It's not um, legal to withhold all of your rent amount, right? It's only half or a up to $300 or half of the rent, whichever amount is greater. However, in order to do that, you must first meet all of these criteria. One, be six months resident, um, paid all rent due, not in violation of the lease, given the landlord at least 14 days to respond to the written request and that that repair is necessary. Like I said, getting a report from an inspector is very helpful. Um, and so that's at that point, you can put the money aside in a bond, for instance, at the court um, to have them hold that, that amount or, or make sure that you keep the money aside somewhere. And that's when you are able to um, deduct that from your rent amount. So for instance, if you decide to repair it yourself, you must keep the receipts and show that you actually made those repairs yourself. And that's why you're deducting it for the rent after all of these criteria have been, have been met. And so lastly, um, we're going to go through the proper steps of eviction. So first, the landlord must demand payment for the past rent owed and not paid or given written notice of their intent to evict you. You must be summoned to court and the summons must be delivered to you in person or posted on the property. A judge must rule that the landlord is entitled to possession of the property and then as soon as 30 days after the judgment, the landlord can file for the eviction order to be executed. Uh, and that should be as soon as 10 days after the judgment, the landlord can file for the eviction order to be executed. And the removal from the property must be overseen by a sheriff in order for it to be legal. So this is basically a graphic. We recently, EHOC recently um, released a number of fact sheets and mailers as well as social media um, sort of graphics showing what are the court procedures? What are the actual po uh, possible outcomes of a trial? So either the judge makes a ruling on the eviction and you're going to you know, find that the judge finds in favor of the landlord or the tenant. If the judge finds in favor of the landlord and you disagree with that judgment, you have the right to apply for a new trial within 10 days. And then from there, the landlord can file to um, file for the sheriff to execute the eviction after 10 days, like I mentioned. Um, however, if you pay all court costs owed and the, um, I'm sorry, all past rent due and the court costs, you do have the right to stay. And so that's if the, when the judge finds in favor of the tenant, the tenant pays all money owed within 10 days and they can also stay in the house. And then the eviction is dismissed. On the other side, there is the possibility of instead of going to court, the agreement or a consent judgment is made between the tenant and the landlord. I'm sorry, instead of going to trial, that's what I meant to say. So the tenant can follow the terms of agreement or the tenant does not follow the terms of the agreement. And when they don't follow the terms, then the landlord may ask for an eviction or the money garnishment, right? All right, and so overall, um, with illegal evictions, a landlord is not allowed to come and remove you from, their prop from your property on their own without a court order, um, which means that they cannot come and change the locks, remove your belongings, shut off the utilities, remove or board up the windows, um, or other things, right? So this is only for after, you know, if the landlord does not have an actual notice, the sheriff hasn't come out to try to, to remove your belongings and all of those things. That would be considered an illegal eviction. And if you find yourself locked out, Legal Services of Eastern Missouri works specifically um, with illegal evictions as well as EHOC. But again, there's a sample notice letter in that packet that we sent out um, for you all. It's an illegal lockout letter. You can inform the landlord, you know, that you know that they are letting, they are illegally locking you out. Um, St. Louis City, in St. Louis City, um, the St. Louis Police Department is able to assist you with that process as well. Um, so you could contact the police and let them know that your landlord is attempting to illegally evict you. Um, and then it, you do have the right to use reasonable force to enter the property, 
but you would be responsible for repairs. So whether that's just like breaking a window and say, for instance, you, you locked your med, you know, you have your medicine medication in the building and you need to get that out. You have the right to reasonably uh, apply a reasonable amount of force to enter and get those things. But you would be, you know, responsible for those repairs. So obviously use discretion with that. Um, so with security deposits, this is the amount of money that covers the damages, right, that we talked about. They should not be more than two months rent and the landlord must return the security deposit or provide a written list of damages within 30 days after you move out. So um, you're, they're conducting the move-in inspection with the landlord so that you're able to see the move-in and the move-out inspection with the landlord so that one, you can compare the conditions that you were given your, your housing in, but also when you're leaving out, you're making sure that you have a whole list of, um, alrighty, great. You have your whole list of damages and then you're taking pictures, giving written notice at least a month before your lease, moving out, and then returning all your keys and getting the receipt. So that's really important that you leave the uh, apartment clean and get, get your receipt for the keys because they could say that you're still in possession of the unit. Um, and also provide an affording address. If that does not happen, the landlord must return the deposit, like I said, or a written list of damages 30 days after you move. And if they don't, you can request um, with your forwarding address and keep a copy of that. Uh, you can request, I'm sorry, you can submit that claim to small claims court um, and get double the damages for that. Alrighty. And I know that was a lot of information. Let me go ahead and stop sharing. This is our contact information. And I will share with you all that um, the form for the CDC moratorium. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my bun came out. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Stephanie, you ready? Mm -hmm. I think Rachel's actually going to do the first trivia. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so election trivia time, anyone is welcome to participate. So um, whoever can put the answer in the chat box first um, wins $20 gift card. And yes, thank you for the presentation because it was really, really informative. Um, so our trivia question is how many state amendments to the constitution are on the 2020 ballot um, for Missouri? How many state Constitution amendments and bonus points if you can like name one of them or let us know what it's about. No one's gotten it yet. Keep guessing. <laughs> yes, that's right, Shayla. There are two constitutional amendments on the November ballot. Do you happen to know what one of them are? Well, you win anyway, so <laughs> congratulations. Um, I will <laughs> hear me. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, I have no idea what they are. I just know that I've heard people talking about amendments. So yeah, I got lucky. I can do a very, very quick, like 30 second refresher here. So there's amendment number one and amendment number three, amendment number one. Um, it does a couple of things. So it extends the two-term restriction that only applies right now to the governor and treasurer, um, to the lieutenant governor, secretary of state auditor, and the attorney general, as well as all state um, statewide elected officials. Um, so that just means that all state representatives, they would only be allowed to hold, um, hold office for two, two terms. Um, so if you vote yes on that, then that means that we will enact the two-term restriction and then amendment number three, so this relates to Clean Missouri, which was passed with 62% of the vote in 2019. It was about redistricting and preventing gerrymandering in Missouri. Um, and so if you vote yes on amendment three, it will actually prevent children and non-citizen immigrants from being counted in redistricting, um, which is really um, very concerning because it means that immigrant and black um, communities are going to be undercounted um, and not represented. Um, and then it also limits the ability of any Missouri voter to legally challenge um, the way that their maps are drawn. So you can only challenge within your district rather than the entire map. Um, and then thirdly, it also gets rid of the third party state demographer, uh, demographer who was 
hired to do the redistricting process and, and that would be exchanged for a bipartisan committee appointed by the governor. Um, so I can also send this out if anyone wants to look at any more information about the amendments. But congratulations, Shayla. Thank you for participating in our election trivia. Shayla, you'll receive a gift card for your answer. And to the other folks that are participating, it is a $20 gift card to Amazon. So please be on your lookout for the next opportunity. I, I'm throwing it back to you, Stephanie. All right, so we're gonna move it along to the next speaker again. Thank you so much, Marissa. And if you have any questions for Marissa, feel free to put those in the chat. And Marissa, if you do have to hop off, we can always uh, save those questions and get to you later. Um, and also, Marissa, do you mind just putting your number on the chat um, yes. on the bottom as well? Thank you. I know you mentioned it a few times and it kept going too fast for me to write it down. Oh, okay, sorry about that. So we'll go ahead and hear from And make sure to unmute. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, hello. That was a tricky question because there's Amendment 1 and Amendment 3. So if you knew that there was number 3, you'd think there would be three of them. But number 2 just never made it onto the ballot. So that was a fun one. Um, I have some opinions on 3 if anybody wants to talk after. But today I'm talking about evictions and mediation. So my name is Alad Gross. For those of you who I do not know, wonderful folks who are on here, all those who I do know. Uh, I am the uh, a mediator and the outreach coordinator for the St. Louis Mediation Project. And on your screen, if you're looking at me right now, below me, there should be a phone number and an email for you to contact. Um, that will go to our team. There's a whole bunch of us who are doing these mediations right now in St. Louis County. There's also mediators in St. Louis City. Um, so wherever you are, we can get you. Um, and if you have any questions, contact us too, because I, I spent a lot of time talking to folks who have a lot of questions about what's going on. And so hopefully I can get some answers for you here, but make sure to take those numbers down. So first, uh, I am going to share my screen if I'm able to, I can. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple documents as I talk here today. Um, but the first one I want to show you since we had a wonderful presentation before me, I don't have to talk as much. I can actually show you. Um, the CDC declaration itself. So this is a very important document. Right now we are in what's called an eviction moratorium. There is, there are actually two. Um, there's one that's been put on by the federal government. So this is the CDC. Uh, you will see this form in the link that has already been provided. I've got another link too that's got a few more resources or different ones I should say too. So you'll have it in two different links. But it's important for you to know what this looks like because uh, coming up now, and there's a lot of litigation and other developments around this, you may uh, become very familiar with this thing over time. So this is the CDC document itself. It's a declaration. Uh, there are a whole bunch of words here that you are saying that apply to you. Uh, so you want to make sure to read through those. Some of the things here include you making a best faith effort to try to pay your rent. So keep that in mind when you're signing this too. Uh, and you always kind of want to think about how you're managing the money and trying to get some rent in, in any case, especially with some of these mediations. Um, and so it explains it, what it is to you. Um, and then at the bottom, there's a signature of the declarant, and that is you and the date that you're signing that. Um, and so this is something that you will, uh, in some situations that you might have to fill out, but I wanted you to be able to see it so that you're familiar with it. There's a whole bunch of forms that are involved in this whole process. That is one of them, um, and that is the CDC moratorium. I said that there's two because there's actually one that's ongoing right now in our court system. Right now, uh, many court systems throughout the state, including in the St. Louis area, uh, are not pushing through evictions. Uh, the cases might be going through, but the actual eviction action itself, where the sheriff is coming and, and getting you out of the apartment, uh, or the actual removal is, is not happening. Um, the sheriffs themselves are not being sent out by the judges, and I'm speaking to a whole lot of them uh, just about every week right now. That is currently ongoing in the St. Louis area. Uh, we don't know what is going to happen after December ends. So it's, it's very good for you to take advantage of all the resources that are out there because although there is an eviction moratorium, there is not a rent moratorium, 
which means that the rent is still accruing. Late fees in some situations can be accruing. I know a lot of landlords have taken those off or at least agreeing to remove those, which has been very helpful, uh, but not all are. Uh, but you need to make sure that you, are, you have a plan to try to deal with this stuff so that by the time December ends, if nothing happens in the future, you don't want to be in that bad situation where all of a sudden uh, you're being evicted because you aren't able to pay it off. And there's a bunch of resources out there right now that are there to help you. So I know we'll be talking about those uh, a bit later today. Um, when you get a notice for court, if you're already in the court system, in some situations, you might hear your property manager, your landlord refer to it as you being in legal. You might see a legal fee that's been charged to you. That means that the apartment, the landlord, whoever you're working with is moving you through the court system. Uh, and that means that you should look out for uh, a document coming from the court. It's called a summons. Uh, when you see that document, uh, it will, you know, it won't have too much information. I mean, it will tell you like what's going on, where to go, where to be. You will have to take a very close look at the dates on that document. It's extremely important for you to show up. Now, you don't have to show up in person right now, which is a very big benefit. You are able to show up in a room just like this one in Zoom. Uh, when you are, it is just like this one. There's going to be a whole bunch of folks in there. Uh, one of them will be called the judge, and sometimes uh, the connection breaks. If you don't have a very good internet connection, you'll want to keep that in mind. The reason why you want to show up is because you do not want there to be what's called a default judgment against you. That means that there is a judgment that has been put in place by the court simply because you didn't show up. Uh, and so you can prevent that from happening just by showing up. You have a whole lot of defenses. Legal Services of Eastern Missouri has also already been mentioned. Arch City Defenders is another group, and I've got a link to some of their contact information too that I'll show you. But once you're in that system, if you do need some help, uh, there are organizations and groups out there to help you. But the most important thing is to make sure that you show up. For mediations, we are able to mediate cases both while you're in court, in the court system, and even before. We're actually doing a lot of mediations before these things actually go through the legal process, which has been very helpful for um, a lot of folks so far. So what it, I just want to describe what the mediation process looks like, and I see that there are some questions coming in already, which is great. Um, and if you do have any, put them in the chat because I love answering questions. But the mediation process itself means uh, a few things. Uh, one is instead of having a judge telling you what has to happen, you are now going into a fully voluntary process where you and the landlord are working together to try to reach some kind of an agreement that really works for both of you. As a mediator, I cannot represent you and I can't represent the landlord. I can't represent anybody in that room with me. What I can do is I can sit there and help both of you try to come to some kind of an agreement. Uh, what that agreement could be really depends on your situation. Everybody's situation is a little bit different, uh, but there are a lot of similarities and things that you can expect. One of those things that you can expect is that you will eventually have to pay something, right? There might be a reduction in how much has to be paid. Maybe the time will be spread out and how much has to be paid. Maybe you'll be able to apply for funding from the CARES Act or other resources that is out there right now to help you pay off some of that back rent. Um, and that's great. Those are wonderful solutions. Uh, sometimes landlords are willing to, like I said, get rid of late fees or, like I said, to spread out the time during which you can pay. Sometimes you can agree to pay a little bit each month while you're waiting. So it really does depend on the situation. The whole process is confidential when you do it. And the reason is we want you to be able to be honest. Uh, so that way we can get to an agreement that works for everybody that's there. Because if you're hiding something, the landlord's hiding something, at the end of the day, you get to the agreement and it's on the screen and you're about to sign it. Someone's thinking, oh, you know, that thing I never talked about because I'm hiding it. It's really making me not want to agree to this because I know something I haven't shared with anybody. At the end, that really doesn't help anyone. Um, and right now, since there are resources out there, uh, it's, it's very helpful uh, for all of us to be on the same page anyway. When you do start the mediation process, and I'll share my screen again, so you will see a very similar document come up. 
because in fact it is the same one. But if I go to another tab, it's a different one. This one is the CARES Act Assistance uh, Form. It's a certification that you'll fill out when you first start with us. Uh, and it's actually something that helps you throughout this process. And we're, we're trying to develop some other ways to make applying for CARES Act funding a lot easier. So the CARES Act is something that was passed by uh, Congress. It's a whole bunch of money there to help folks through COVID and everything else that's going on. Um, and so this is this initial form asks a bunch of questions. And here where there's a bunch of check marks here, this is trying to find out if you do qualify under the CARES Act requirements right now, at least at that surface level for us to figure out what's going on with you. And it makes the mediation process way easier because now we know hey, this is what your situation is. Uh, the landlord is sending us a whole bunch of information too oftentimes. And that way, instead of taking forever, uh, the process is uh, quite a lot faster. And then ideally, once you start applying for funding after doing a mediation with us, if you are eligible to do that, you'll have this document, you'll have that information already. So um, that's one of the reasons that we've been doing that too. Um, Mediations can be very helpful. There are situations where you'll have a landlord who does not want to mediate. That's okay. We can still help you. You can still call. You can still email us. Uh, I will reach out. Usually it's me. I will reach out to your landlord if that doesn't work or they don't respond or whatever else. It's still okay. We'll still help you get in the pipeline to apply for CARES Act help. Um, and there is a lot of it out there. Uh, I'm going to share my screen one more time, just in case you aren't dizzy yet. And this is a flyer that is out there right now. It has a whole bunch of resources. So I'll go to the top. Um, it says need help with housing here. And there's a whole bunch of these different groups that have received uh, CARES Act funding through St. Louis County. Some of them also apply in St. Louis City, uh, but we can also get you help with that. And EHOC has been great on that already. So we will get you to the right place. Uh, I have had a few tenants who have gone through this process already. And they said, well, some of these numbers aren't as good as other ones. That's okay. Now I know. And so I could tell you which ones are better than the other ones. So uh, it is helpful to have had that experience already and ha have had wonderful folks go through this already. And come back and tell me, hey, you know what? You should try this one first. So uh, if you are in need of rental assistance or utility assistance, um, this is very, very helpful. And oftentimes those are the two things that folks are getting uh, behind. Uh, and I know Beyond Housing has been a wonderful partner so far for folks who are in the 24-1 Blueprint. And uh, uh, they've been doing wonderful, wonderful work. Those of you who are fortunate to live uh, in that area, you are, uh, you're very fortunate right now given the situation with the CARES Act funding and how uh, long it's taking sometimes, but Beyond Housing has been doing a great job. So um, you want to deal with these problems as early as you can. You don't want to sit there like I often do with problems with my home when things are breaking down. I kind of just leave it there and hope it gets better on its own. Uh, it, these are not getting better on their own, but they can get better if you work at it and you get some help. So that's why we're out here. Uh, please contact us and we're happy to describe uh, any of those situations. So there was a question in here from Stephanie. Uh, resources to reschedule court dates if you're unable to show up due to work schedule or childcare. Um, yes, uh, so that is something that you can do. If you get uh, a notice initially uh, from the court saying, hey, here's your court date, here's when you have to show up. It is important to try to show up when you can, uh, but there, there is contact information for the court for you to call them and let them know what is going on. If you are having an issue contacting them, you can contact us as well. That's fine. Uh, I'm happy to walk you through that whole process. But you can ask for what's called a continuance on cases. And uh, you're entitled to those just like you are on other cases too. And it applies for landlord and tenant law as well. So you can ask to move those dates. Uh, the same is true for our mediation. So we, we normally set these mediations up over Zoom, that way that you can do them uh, uh, from wherever you are, uh, and that way you don't have to come in to, to a certain location with everything that's going on. And some some housing uh, areas right now, we've actually got partnerships with some landlords where they have iPads on site and they've got separate rooms so that you don't have to, if you don't have uh, technology to do this, uh, you can still participate. The same is true with court. If you don't have uh, the cell phone to participate 
or a computer to participate, you are able to go to the county courts now and they do have some limited areas there where they're keeping people apart. Uh, we're actually developing, well, I should say the county is currently developing uh, even more space right now. So um, there should be a couple, uh, couple locations even outside of the court over in Clayton uh, there should be a couple other ones that they're looking to expand as well. So hopefully that will be happening soon, especially since there um, are an increasing number of folks in this situation. Uh, with our mediations, we do try to schedule it uh, on, you know, at certain set times because that's when our mediators have been set to be available. But if you do have a work conflict, we want to help you keep that job uh, as much as we can. So we will try to work around that too. And, and we try to be flexible as well. Uh, of course, that will also uh, depend on landlord's availability. So once you get into all that, it can be, it can take a little bit of time, but uh, we do our best to get those uh, in as soon as possible. So, yeah. So again, uh, the group is called the St. Louis Mediation Project. We are working very closely with just about everybody who's on here already. Uh, and if you do have any questions or anything else, my name is Alad Gross and you can contact us at that phone number and uh, at that email. Thank you so much, Alad. And that was a great transition also uh, to the next piece of our agenda, which is hearing about what resources are available. Uh, so we're gonna hear from Corey and Susan, or I believe just Corey, um, about the rental assistance and um, rental and mortgage and you. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Corey Eichhorn, I'm from Beyond Housing. And I'm gonna share my screen with you to kind of go over some of the the rent and utility assistance we have available and, and mortgage assistance. Um, Beyond Housing received about a quarter million dollars uh, in financial assistance to the CARES Act to provide rent, mortgage, or utility assistance. Um, at this point, a good chunk of that money is actually already gone, but we can't, we, we still have a, a fair amount of money to go. Um, expenses are eligible if they were incurred March through December of this year and families can receive up to $8,000 per household. Um, so that's a pretty significant chunk of change, um, you know, that I'm sure would help a lot of families. Uh, some of the, there are a lot of requirements to come with this source of funding, including being <clears throat> a resident of the 24-1 community, which uh, is essentially the Normandy School District uh, boundaries. Um, and you have to have a documented COVID hardship, which you know, there's, there's a list on the right there for some of the things that are included there, like a termination letter, unemployment benefit stub or letter, foreclosure letter, eviction letter, or even a ledger from your landlord showing that you have uh, rent in arrears. Um, there are monthly rent limits, which I don't think has really been too much of a, of a concern. Um, some income limits, which is number four that's on here. And then we are requiring <clears throat> a fair amount of documentation so we can process payment. Uh, if you or someone you know is interested in obtaining rent, rent, mortgage, or utility assistance, you can visit r241.com. We are located in the rent utility assistance section. And I'm going to put a link on, in the comments section here in a moment. When you click on this online application, it takes you to a form where you can upload and submit all the, or the majority of the information that we need in order to process uh, the assistance. There's also instructions on here so that if you need to scan in your lease or W9, you can use apps that are built into the iPhone or Android phone system in order to be able to upload the documents directly using your uh, iPhone or Android phone right into our system. Um, you know, one, one thing that has been kind of a challenge is we do have to get cooperation from the landlord in terms of collecting the copy of their W9 and other documents that kind of go along with that. Uh, but that's something that we're working on the, on the backside. But you can upload all of your information and your files directly into this web portal. And then uh, the primary contact for this grant is actually Susan Roach. I'll put her contact information in the comments section as well. And if anyone is needing rent, mortgage, or utility assistance within the 24-1 community, we would encourage them to uh, use the link that's on in the comments section, that way um, their spot in line gets reserved because we're doing it based on a first come first served basis. That's my plug. 
Thank you so much, Corey Eichhorn. And next we will be hearing from Corey Dickens to hear more about Beyond Housing, Rental Housing um, and uh, Rental Assistance, Rental Support. Good evening, everyone. I'll try to talk fast so that we stay on track here, um, but I am Beyond Housing's Director of Housing. Um, and thank you, Marissa and Alad and Corey Eichhorn for sharing all the great information related to tenant rights and housing stability. Um, I'm here to discuss our rental housing program. Um, so if you are looking for housing, Beyond Housing does own um, over 400 two and three bedroom single family affordable single family homes. Um, most of those are in the 24-1 Normandy footprint. We do have about 100 that are scattered throughout St. Louis County. We also have 95 senior apartments for adults 55 and older. Um, unfortunately, right now we are working off of a 60 to 90 day wait list, um, but to get added to our wait list, you would want to visit our website, which is beyondhousing.org. Um, and there's a full list of qualifications listed on our website. I won't go over them all, but most importantly, um, a lot of people get us confused with income-based housing. We're not income-based, we're only affordable housing. So you would have to have three times the monthly rent. Our rents range from like 600 to 750. So the minimum would be about 1800 gross income. And then you also have to be able to secure utilities in your name. Um, the nice thing about all the CARES funding that's going on and other assistance, um, even through Beyond Housing is there, there, there is assistance out there to help with utilities if you do have a high balance um, and need to get that paid down. Um, our program is unique, um, unique other than other rental programs because we do combine that quality affordable rental housing with supportive services. Um, that includes intensive case management, budgeting, credit counseling, and crisis intervention. Um, we are seeing a lot of that right now with the pan pandemic. Um, each family in our um, program is matched with a resource specialist and they help guide um, the resident and right now they are assisting with rental and utility assistance to make sure that families do stay stable in their homes. Um, our ultimate goal in our program is to achieve housing stability um, and to reduce mobility out of the school district. Um, we work towards self-identified goals, so residents create their goals. They create short-term and long-term goals, whether that's um, furthering their education, career advancement, or home ownership. Um, if you know somebody is looking for immediate housing um, or shelters beyond housing wouldn't be the place to go but i do have a couple of other resources or recommendations that you can refer them to my favorite is the affordable housing locator and that is on missouri housing development commission's website and that website is a HL for affordable housing locator dot mhdc.com socialserve.com is another affordable website um, that is who the housing authority st louis housing authority uses um, zillow is a, a popular one lately for single family homes and then um, unitedways211.org has a great list of um, shelters for any emergency housing needed. Um, and as Corey Eichhorn mentioned, um, there is, and Alad mentioned too, there is a lot of assistance out for um, rental assistance and sometimes that can apply to first month's rent and deposit if it is a COVID related need. Um, so if you are running into trouble getting um, housing because you don't have that assistance, um, that first month's rent deposit, definitely reach out and see um, if other organizations can help with that, that initial first step. That's all I've got. Thank you very much, Corey. Really appreciate it. And thanks for all those additional resources uh, that in case, you know, Beyond Housing isn't the right fit for people interested in housing. So uh, with that, we're going to transition to the next door prize that we have in this virtual meeting. Uh, and that is another election trivia. And um, Stephanie, you have, uh, someone has a question. Oh, sure. Oh, here we go. So Olivia is asking to Corey, do we look at all evictions? And if so, how far do you, how far back do you go? The nice thing about Beyond Housing's rental program um, is that it is very lenient. Um, we don't look at credit scores. We do run a credit che check, but we're not looking at credit scores. Really, we're just looking at the utilities to make sure that applicants can get utilities on. Um, we are willing to forgive one eviction. Um, and um, we do also do a criminal background check as well. So no felonies over seven years. 
Thanks. Any additional questions for either of the quarries? All right, so uh, the next election trivia question we have is to name two differences between mail-in and absentee ballots. And you can put that in the chat as well. $20 gift card up for grab. Cora, you can't get it. <laughs> and uh, named, you have to name two in order to get the, get the gift card as well. But there may be um, a hint in the chat box right now for one of them. Uh oh, that one might be a little tricky. You are welcome to to Google. Uh oh. Okay. Hey. Hey, 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 Alex. No, Alex. Please, somebody else other than a Beyond Housing staff person answer. You can use my uh, correct answers, apparently. Here, <laughs> Raina's. Uh, just... There you go. Thank you, Jacqueline. Yay. Thank you. All right. Um, I can also share um, some additional information right here. Raina, did you have, sorry if I interrupted you just now. No. If you could go ahead and just chat me pri privately your email address and you'll receive an Amazon gift card um, via email. So for all of you, if you aren't familiar, um, you know, this election season is a little different because we are allowing mail-in ballots as well because of COVID. Um, but this just breaks down the difference between absentee ballots and mail-in voting. Um, so the main uh, difference, one of them that Alex pointed out was the excuses. Um, so, you know, for absentee ballots, especially for people who are at risk for contracting COVID-19, you're able to use absentee ballot then, um, incapacitated, physical disability, um, absent, working as a poll worker, those are all reasons. Um, for mail-in, you don't have to have a reason. So no matter what, you may just want to mail in your ballot, vote early, then you can do that. Um, for both of them, the deadline to apply is the 21st, so that's coming up. So if you're interested, just make sure to take note of that. Um, and then the other piece that is different also is for absentee. Um, you don't need a notary, but mail-in voting does. And Beyond Housing actually has a number of people who are notarized that can um, help you get that notarized if you are interested in doing a mail-in. So make sure, feel free to contact one of us if you're interested in doing that. Uh, we do encourage you to vote far in advance if you can, just because of the um, delays we've been having at the post office, they have to receive those ballots by 7 p.m. on election day. And for mail-in ballots, they have to be mailed in, they cannot be dropped off. But absentee votes can be dropped off um, in person by mail or by a close relative. And that's that, any questions? Um, either about the trivia about the elections, um, but also for any of the panelists we have today or any questions that you'd just like answered um, about this topic. And feel free to say that um, either in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and ask that question as well. I think everybody's really quiet. <laughs> Anybody that participated have any feedback for us? Yes. Go ahead, Ms. Hoskins. Okay. Uh, who was the person that uh, I mailed the ballot my name to? It's me. Don't worry about it. I have your information. I'll send that to you. Did okay. you, did you get the information you needed out of the uh, presentation? Thank you. Okay. She said, Olivia says she missed the answer about the evictions. Can that be repeated one more time? Corey, are you still there? She may have popped off. Is this for evictions for beyond housing qualifications? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, so with our qualifications, we do forgive one eviction as long as it's under $1,500. Thank you, Corey. And then in terms of the sample ballot, um, Joyce was asking that. So we recommend going to St. Louis County Board of Elections. 
on there, they will have a link to the sample ballot and uh, you can go ahead and use that. You would just put your address in and then find it specifically for you. Um, one thing I did want to note is earlier, we talked about the two statewide constitutional amendments. Just note if you're outside of St. Louis County, for example, I live in St. Louis City, I have a few other ballot initiatives that I'm going to be voting on as well. They aren't statewide, um, they're local, but feel for, make sure to check your local ballot in case there's anything else on the ballot that's coming up. There's also a lot of judges that are up for retention as well as a lot of other um, elected positions. So uh, be sure to check out those simple ballots. Um, I can also in a second uh, put a, a link as well or Joyce, I'll, I'll, I'll mail that, email that to you later on as well. Um, if there aren't any other questions, uh, we would like to invite everybody to the next workshop we have. Um, we are doing these workshops once a week on Wednesday. So the next one is next Wednesday, October 7th also from 6 30 to 8 p.m and this one is essentially a small business survival kit we know that right now small businesses are really struggling so we just want to make sure that businesses as well as residents have tools that they need to be able to support small businesses especially through covid um, and through uh, the upcoming recession as well so please be sure to share the word um, make sure even if you're not a business owner you're welcome to come i'm sure there's going to be something for you to gain from there and we really appreciate all of you participating. And another final thank you to all of the speakers. This was really informative and we're really excited to share this recording um, as well afterwards so that this can be a resource for additional residents and renters. Anything else to wrap us up, Raina? Thank you guys for participating. God bless and good night. Bye guys. Bye Raina. Bye, Alan.